Ahoy, fellow microphilia enthusiasts. Jesus, Greg. And welcome aboard the Joy of Trek, a microscopic podcast exploring the subspace compression anomalies and Jem Hadar hierarchies of Star Trek. All, All of it. it. I'm Kaki. I'm Kay. And inside the circuitry compartment is your chief engineer, Greg. Together, we're on a mission through the plasma vents of Star Trek to find the honored elder in every <laughs> alpha and the excellence in every episode. Even the Klingon poetry. Because every episode must be someone's favorite, and it might as well be us. So measure yourself twice and join us as we cross the Rubicon uh, into the, the joy, joy of, of Trek. Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you uh, very much to be with us again today. Day, and I don't know why I went in that direction, but here we go. Right, I there like we it. Go. Hey, I like your you're good at vamping. Like you do sort of freestyle jazz with syntax, oh. and I kind of dig it. Like, <laughs> just have confidence, man. Like okay. everybody's into it with it. You All know, right. like okay, yeah, no, just Sorry. grip it just and rip it, baby. <laughs> just oh, just cracking my can of Coke so I can have something to drink while we're uh, on the subject of this episode. <laughs> so yes. Uh, uh, who guessed which ship episode run? Did we give uh, hints at the last one of this episode, or did we skip out on that? I don't no, remember. we did, we, we did, did, we oh, did. Right. Uh, okay, full disclosure, because this is how our, our timey-wimey little vortex sort of goes, so we've recorded this a bit in advance, and it's actually been quite a bit since we've had an opportunity to record together. Yes, absolutely. I was, uh, I've been on a vacation, so we've, uh, yeah, we have a good, an ample buffer in our schedule so that we can... Yeah, like, you were getting some uh, some Andorian skiing in I with did, some buddies. I did, absolutely. It was fantastic. I've got this, like, uh, Batman tan going for me right now. Oh, awesome. <laughs> What's a Batman tan? This is like only your lower half of your face. You oh, know? Like... on account of the ski helmet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <Yeah. laughs> well, meanwhile, I had a really bad case of laryngitis. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then I coughed so hard, I, I cracked all my ribs. <laughs> yeah, all of them. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Are, how now, are, they, are they recovering well? Are you off the painkillers? Weaning off. Okay. Weaning off. I'm okay. uh, having fewer dalliances with uh, uh, Mrs. Tramadol <laughs> and her <laughs> chemical daughters. Yes. That's a potent one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm told. Yeah, well, maybe Dr. Bashir can have a quick look at you and wave his uh, magic wand at you to heal your cracked ribs. Okay, there was a moment in this episode, not to dump the warp core straight away, <laughs> where, where like, after something terrible happens, Jadzia goes, oh, oh, no, and then he comes over and he goes, woo, 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 and she goes, oh, that's better. Yeah, they wanted to save up on the makeup, you know, that they didn't want to, like, have her, like, with this terrible woo on her face the rest of the episode. So I want a woo-woo-woo thing that just makes all the boo-boos go away. I think don't think you're the only one in that one. Okay, this episode. So, we are doing DS9 Season 6, Episode 14, One Little Ship. First aired on February 14th. Oh, it's a... a, a oh, very close. It's yeah. a Valentine's one. 1998, written by David Weddle and Bradley Thompson and directed by Alan Croker. Now, you and I have seen a lot of the work of David Weddle and Bradley Thompson because Ronald D. Moore, one of the principal writers mm -hmm. of, like, the second season of Deep Space Nine, he cut his teeth on The Next Generation, went on to do Battlestar Galactica. Like, yeah. the, I think the time has passed when we call it, you know, the new one. BSG, yes. Because it is... Battlestar Galactica, yeah. and then you, you, you there's know, the, you have... Yeah, there's the 1970s TOS, yes. T-O-S. <laughs> T-O-B. The original, oh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. And it's a writing team, much like uh, Ronald D. Moore and Brandon Braga have been, and they're huge on their uh, military history, and, like, they really enjoyed, like, doing stuff on The Defiant. Yeah. If we find out this time... So the synopsis of this episode is, this is the story of a little ship that took a little trip. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. I assumed that was you. Actually, that was me. Oh, that, that was, was you. Your okay. Yeah, we haven't really divided the role of the person who has to do the synopsis because we, you know, we don't want to straight up copy something else. And my various dalliances with computer technologies have not resulted in something reliable. And oh, oh, hello. We're being joined by our podcat, the inestimable Pip. She's decided that now is lap time. Oh, and that's. I mean, and that's better than attacking cable time. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Just like let her have just a little sit there. my headphones. This okay. This yeah. is working. This is working great. Let's see how long this holds. Oh uh, no! Unfortunately, your phone is attached okay, to a cable. I'll, I'll take off the charging <laughs> cable of the phone where I'm reading here. Yeah. Yeah. She's an adorable kitten. But you're right to uh, uh, to pay attention to Greg because it is thanks to Greg that we have this recommendation. All right. Well, in your own words, Greg. Oh, actually, in the words of his brother. Oh, okay. So, as for the recommendation, we have Lieutenant Commander Sheev Palpatine. 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 Is that how you spell it? Palpa uh, palp palp Pals is fine. Uh, he recommends DS9614 uh, <laughs> One Little Ship, saying... So as a child of the 80s, it's no surprise that the Disney movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids made a big impact on me. 
If you combine that concept from my youth with the techno babble about what one would need if one wanted to breathe the air, someone as small as, as, as they get, whatever, you've got yourself kind of a great Star Trek episode. Star Trek going full camp is the best. It's like a break from the uh, we gotta save the universe uh, uh, mode that like a lot of Star Trek uh, nowadays kind of falls into. And it's really just a breath of fresh air. It also has like the Dominion being like menacing, but like beatable because like it's this tiny ship and they beat them. And then uh, Worf's poetry, which is just kind of like um, like an amazing like it's like a DS9 bit and it's, just, it's the best, whatever. Also, uh, any of your listeners now listen to Rebel Air. It's great, especially the holiday episode. It's probably the best thing in the world. So, uh, yeah, that's all. Air yes. with H with an H there, a little yes. little reference to some fun that Greg and I used to have, and we with another podcast. Yes, yes. When he took me on a journey through Star Wars Rebels, and the podcast was called Rebel Air, we had a lot of a lot of fun. Yeah, and Greg's brother Zach. Here representing himself as Lieutenant Commander Sheev Palpatine was oh. a regular contributor yes. there. So I'm very glad to uh, thank you for joining Boston's, us here. I believe. Yes, we had a segment that we will not be repeating that did result in uh, any time we made a little Star Wars boo-boo, uh, listeners would get to write in and tell us all about it. And you know what? Star Trek, I'm just, I'm, we're just not going to bother. <laughs> it's not going to bother with that. We're, just, we're not going to bother with that. Hey. Hey, very good. Yeah, we sure did end up killing about like 3,000 plus Bothans at some point. It was really bad. It was really, really bad. It was a lot of fun. I think it's for the best that that moment in time is behind us now because there's so much blood on our hands, Cocky. So that actually leads to a little trivia thing that I see here, that the episode was dubbed Honey, I Shrunk the Runabout behind the scenes, which is (laughs) very good, which also answers one of the questions that I have, because like since one of my questions was, since when do shuttles have phasers and photon torpedoes? Ah, well, the Danube-class runabout has long been mentioned as having photon torpedo launchers, but they've never been used before. Okay. We've never seen them. Tiny little little, tiny poop photons. Poop, 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 poop. I know, they're so adorable, little firecrackers. I mean, they're pack of wallops still. Oh, and for those of you who aren't familiar, I mean, if you've seen this episode, then the one-line synopsis would have been enough, but let's see if we can do this. So while on a strangely scientific mission, which is a nice break from the uh, Dominion War, the Defiant is being sent off to investigate some strange spatial compression phenomenon. And while traveling in their runabout, which the Defiant can sometimes house... And Whenever sometimes, plot requires yeah, it, yeah. You know, how that goes. Three of the crew are traveling through this compression field, and then they come out... And they're tiny. And meanwhile, the Defiant has been taken over by Jem Hadar, and this tiny little runabout has yep. to sort of sneak inside and cause all sorts of shenanigans to help their captive crew. And the runabout is about this size, and the crew is about this size, which would really help a lot more if this wasn't audio only, and you could actually see what I was doing with my hands there. But just watch the episode, and you'll see them doing it many times when they're talking about the actual size. Oh, you know what? Or, okay, okay, this may be edited out depending on what kind of discussion we have about this afterward, but you could also join our Patreon, uh-huh. links to which you can find at joyoftrek.links. Uh, and you can watch me doing big fish, little fish cardboard box. And <laughs> <laughs> Well, we might start posting some packs of GIFs from, oh. from the episode, like oh. we used to. Are we, from, taking, uh, from are we taking on Paramount's copyright lawyers? Hey, le- oh. <laughs> <laughs> let's see how far we get. <laughs> Let's okay, see so it, let's, let's see how long it takes before we get our first season to this letter. Yeah, just and I mean maybe look. Hey, there's only one way to find out, which yeah. is sign up for our Patreon. You'll help pay for these microphones that I'm sure these cables will will definitely need replacing pretty soon because my God, Pip, <laughs> your lovely pod kitty is sure eyeing them with oh, some yes. interest. It's dangly and uh, thing, so it must be a toy. Do you yeah. have a warp core that you want oh, to uh, right. that you want to well, dump? Which is what we. Yep. Yeah. Oh, wrong one. It's the other one. I say we eject the warp core! Oh, let's see. Do I have any big ones? And as we discussed previously, yes. like, I'm going to be a little bit critical, yeah. and I'm going to also, like, have... You can have one more than me. Yes. Are we going, like, back to the technical stuff or just, like, the things that I didn't like about this episode? I mean, or do I do we get to pick on the technical stuff during the uh, let's do during the course during. of let's the Let's do the episode. course okay. of the right. like the, really think about because I think that's how we originally titled this segment. Yes. But other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, what did you think of the play? <laughs> yes. Like something really glaring that you just have to squint your way past. And unless it's technical, I don't have any. No, same no, here. No, there's no nothing story-wise that. 
I, bothers me very much or that was like, yeah, no. I guess Nothing we get to keep on Warp Core. Yes. I thought it was an absolute delight. There's some techno babble stuff that I'd like to have a pick at, but we'll get to that when it comes up. When All it right, comes up. awesome. Okay, so in that case, I do press the right button this time. Yes. Right, into the episode. We start with a shot in which the Defiant and the Rubicon are flying towards a space anomaly. And in the long tradition of Starfleet taking liberties with the security and life of their officers, they send a live crew in. Okay. You sure you don't have any warp core, brother? No, I'm that, that's, that does sort of sound like it. No, but... I'm just like, <laughs> this is standard operating procedure for uh, Starfleet, you know? We have hey, an unknown they... phenomenon where, so in this case, they actually sent in some probes, which did they come out. They have sent probes. Which, which did are, come which out totally properly. Fine. And uh, yes, so therefore they are fairly confident that it will work on humans. And the Rubicon runabout is uh, tethered by uh, a, a transport beam. Yes. Uh, what's it called? A tractor beam. Tractor beam, sorry, not a transport beam, yes. To help them guide. So, uh, how small are they? The miniaturization process won't begin until the runabout reaches the edge of the accretion disk. I suppose they also tried that on the probes if that uh, tractor beam still works on a shrunken thing. Yeah. Because we, as is established by uh, something that Bashir said, they are actually shrunken and also the molecules in, on board the ship, everything is just shrunken. Because I think it's like some... They mentioned acc accretion disk several times, which is a term that I'm, I've generally only heard... No, wait, did it say accretion disk? We're about to enter the accretion disk. Or... We'll talk again once we've left the accretion disk and reversed the effects of the compression. Rubicon out. Because an accretion disk happens around... Anything well, with gravity and dust. Yes, exactly. I think they said accretion disk, and I was, yeah, thinking, and, and right. I was hearing uh, Event Horizon. They penetrated the accretion disk. Because it was like more of a... Uh, a wishful black thinking effect. there. Black walls. Yeah. Black well, look at the graphic, like this, this oh, yeah, sort of nebula thing. Yeah, we have we've got the Jeeves, yes, we have Jeeves uh, yes. which maybe you can find on the Patreon. Go and sign up. It's only $5. Right. We have a lovely nebula with a few stars in us and nothing which even looks remotely like an accretion disk. But, all right. Hey, you don't... You might be seeing it from the top on. It's not very disky, is it? It doesn't have to be. <laughs> it's with a... Actually, <laughs> hey. Yeah. Do you know why it's a comp why you spell compact disc with a C and hard disc with a K? No, do tell. Because a disc has to be disc shaped with a C. Yeah. But a disc with a K is sort of more metaphorical. Oh, you know what the platters inside a, in a, inside a hard disc look like, right? Yeah. Yeah. But they are disc shaped. Yes. Okay. No, that's yeah. No. <laughs> no, not just saying. No, just just saying. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. no. <laughs> Fine. And uh, did you uh, uh, speaking of this, rem oh, remember ooh. those credit card sized little compact discs that you occasionally got from uh, uh for our younger listeners, <laughs> oh God, yes. close your eyes and imagine... <laughs> the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> imagine taking a compact disc and then uh, introducing it to another compact disc and, like, after a while, they sort of settle down and they give each other a very special hug and then a baby compact disc comes out. <laughs> and then you take that baby and you cut the top and sides off into a sort of a rectangle that fits inside a, a CD player. Yeah. It took some careful aligning unless you had a, a laptop uh, CD player which had one, one of those, those spindles that you things you click it on that worked really well on those. On the other ones, not so much. Yeah, you couldn't exactly like feed it into the slot on your <laughs> car CD player. <laughs> no, that would not work. <laughs> anyway. But that was for singles and stuff. Right. Really so cool. much for old people of Star Trek. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hey, we are little green bamboo shoots yeah. in a forest of, of wizened sequoias when it comes to Star Trek. This is true. There are many people out there who are proudly uh, 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 still podcasting and enjoying the original series, having seen it firsthand, uh, and what a treasure it is to be part of that culture. Yes. I don't feel any smaller. Well, believe it or not, you're about a meter tall and shrinking fast. In a few minutes, you're going to be half the size of a combat. There's a comforting thought. Brian O has seems to have a little bit of in, um, oh, how shall we put it size envy size envy yeah yeah he's, it's like, he's, size a bit, he's a little bit nervous about uh, sizing up to uh, everybody else. I think it's brilliantly written because it starts off on the bridge of the Defiant and Kira is walking around asking the same question of everyone else. <laughs> yes. So they're going to be smaller. Yes, in fact. And then Nog gives a perfectly good scientific explanation and she goes, okay, so and she just has going the to hardest be time not to crack up. I'm not laughing. No. Just because we are shrinking three people to the size of coffee cups. <laughs> Smaller, actually. Get out of your system. 
Because that's the audience reaction. See, he's a surrogate for the for the audience. Yeah. Because yeah, we're doing some Land of the Giants shit. We're doing we're doing yeah. Honey, I Shrunk the Danube. Yes. Oh, what's was that other movie where they like shrunk a submarine to go into a patient and? Oh, uh, the Voyage of uh, the, the something. Voyage oh no, something? Uh, Incredible Voyage was yes. one, and also like Inner Space. Oh yes, that's the one. Yeah. Oh, featuring Robert Picardo as the cowboy. Very Ooh. sexy character. He still had his hair then. Inner Space is a really good movie we should watch yeah. sometime. Bashir is actually goading uh, um, O'Brien along a little bit. He's like feeding into his insecurities. and like, he's, he's doing this constantly throughout the episode. He's just oh, like, yeah. he's like, I mean, they're besties. And like, he is just like digging in there, you know. And he's <laughs> bored. He's got nothing else to do. He's not doing the science shit. He's just there monitoring their life science. Any medic could have done it. Yeah, okay. But he wanted to be there to mess with Brian O. There's another interesting bestie relationship, which is happening on the bridge, where Kira, when she has her, her breakdown, laughing, then Worf goes, I do not see what is so humorous about being small. Neither do I. Yeah, can, yeah, <laughs> hey. And of course, Worf and Dax are married at this point. Yes. yes. And as their communications are breaking up because the antennas are shrinking, like she says, okay, we're entering the accretion disc or what the fuck ever. Yeah. And I can't wait to hear the poem. That she commissioned Worf to write. Because apparently it's an ancient Klingon tradition that great accomplishments should be commemorated yes. with a poem, and she's and this asked... this is a little ship that went on a little trip. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> As Worf proclaims the first line of the poem to be. Only after much goading at the end, because now, like, Cisco asks for, well, what yeah. have you got so far? And then Nog bumps in with, oh, they're entering the anomaly now. And Kira goes... Now, is it my imagination, or did the kid just cover for him? This could be the beginning of a... Beautiful friendship. <laughs> yes. Like, Nicely done. Very, very well smoothly done. And then things go not so smooth. Oh. Because just as the ship is, like, approaching smallness, factor 15, the boat goes a-rocking and it's abandoned by its tether and they're free-falling. Because the Defiant is being attacked by the Dominion. Yeah, a oh, gem our ship. Yes, warp drive offline, uh, impulse drive offline. And suddenly, apparently, shields offline as well because the Gem Hadar beam straight aboard. Uh, yeah, and with a minimal effort, take over the ship. Was a very, very successful ambush because apparently, like they used this anomaly to sneak up on the Defiant, hide their warp signature. Yep, and having made a bold and daring raid into Federation territory. So yes, unfortunately, the Defiant has been aborted. Aborted. Yes. Yeah. And the bold Jamadar declares, like, Surrender, or you will all be killed. <laughs> <laughs> Watch me twirl my horny moustache. They don't have moustaches. They've got these weird little chin teeth. They're horny. They're horns. They're little oh, horns. Fair point. Yes. Chin no, teeth okay. are... But the crew on the runabout have no idea because they've closed the blast shutters against the gamma ray flux. Yes. And so while they're trying to get everything back online and Jadzia's little boo-boo is fixed with Bashir's woo-boo, yes. which I was very, very uh, envious of, because <laughs> that seems a lot better than uh, uh, the various medical miracles that I've been granted by my doctor, for which I'm very grateful mm. and which I'm obeying to the letter, they do have some side effects. Painkillers go a long way. Mm -hmm. See, I just thought you were jealous because you wanted Dr. Bashir to show you his woo-woo. So there's a lot of fixing to be done. And uh, with all these systems down, okay, they've got no communications, we've got no optical sensors, and we've got uh, these blasts that are sh shut. And Jadzia says, like, give me visual or give me windows, whichever one's fastest. Give me visual or give me death. In the meantime, we see that there is, like, a little bit of strife among the Dominion. The Jem Hadar are being led by the first, as is traditional. Yeah. Uh, but there seems to be, I mean, I, I don't remember, it's been far too long since I've seen DS9 in mm -hmm. its entirety. Has there really been a mention before of the alphas and the, the gammas at this point, or is this when we're introduced to the new... Uh... There's not been a mention of this before, or since, in fact. Oh, So okay. here's, the, here's the thing. Since the closure, or since the <clears throat> mining of the wormhole that connects the gamma quadrant to the alpha quadrant, through which the Dominion has poured its troops in order to conquer the alpha quadrant, uh, since that's been closed, the Jem'Hadar have been isolated, right. and refreshments of the troops have not been arriving. And so apparently the founders have set about reading, which is interesting since we've only ever seen male Jem'Hadar, yeah. male presenting Jem'Hadar, I should say, have been breeding a new class of... No. Uh, well, I'm assuming they've vat grown them since they, like, I don't know how much time is spent, but... They say breeding? It goes yeah. very fast. If you had not eliminated our fleet in the wormhole, 
there would have been no need to breed Alpha Quadrant Gemidar. They are mature size and fully capable and knowledgeable of warp technology within a relative short period of time. We've actually seen that on uh, mm-hmm. on an earlier episode of Deep Space Nine. An infant alien was discovered and, and nurtured and raised by the crew. And to their surprise, like it grew incredibly quickly, absorbed information incredibly quickly, became a toddler and then a tween and a teen, and, and then a full blown Jem'Hadar. And it turned out to be a Jem'Hadar to their great yeah. surprise. Yeah. So that's how fast they go. And apparently a new alpha group has been created who are being genetically and psychologically designed. For combat in the alpha quadrant. And you see that in a few aspects. Like, they're a bit more, like, boastful. They're less cautious. They also stand less on formality, as you see. With- yes, they don't uh, do the whole uh, ritual when they get their uh, daily infusion of uh, life juice. And I wonder if that maybe is a sort of response to, I don't know, maybe on the Gamma Quadrant, most of the cultures there are more ritualistic mm-hmm. than the ones that they found in the Alpha Quadrant. And so it, it somehow makes yeah. sense to breed a species that they can better model more casual, uh, yeah. less formal species like the Klingons that they're facing. Yeah, fair enough. Who are more ritualistic again, but... Well, they have rituals, yeah. but they're also extremely practical. Like, consider the, the Klingon language where... You have no niceties. You have no please. You have no right. thank you. Yeah. Like the idea of a Klingon conversation is you walk up to the person that you want something from, you say what you want, they say their response, and you walk away without yeah. saying goodbye. Yeah. Right? It's like a Hollywood movie phone call where, <laughs> yes. where somebody gives you the information that you need and you just hang up, not saying bye. <laughs> yes. It's always like, what's it like for the person on the other side? <laughs> We have the situation where the first of the Jem Hadar is an alpha, and the second, although he is respectfully referred to as elder several times, yeah. is clearly not in charge anymore. And the new kid in town mm. is trying to prove himself. He is like, Meh. he rarely listens to the advice that the elder gives. It must be gratifying for an elder to end his career with a victory. I feel privileged to be here with you at such a moment. Yeah, he's he's being a little bit dickish about it, like, uh, truth be told. But they... uh, Jem'Hadar don't live long. Oh, yeah, okay. They might be... uh, I think they live less than a decade. Uh, And I think uh, you can see that in a bit of the makeup. You know, great job by Michael Westmore. Yeah, I was trying to see if there were any systematic differences between the alphas and the deltas. Right. uh, Sorry, the the gammas, but I couldn't quite spot anything consistently. Well, the only gamma we've got is the second. Right. And he's significantly grayer. He's more pallid. The other is older. So, yeah. Right. It, yeah. And you can also see that on like his head crest, the, the, yeah. the horns, the bones are fused together in like a single crest, whereas some of the younger ones have individual horns or, or teeth. Or maybe that's just you know, how individuals work. Yeah. Well, he reports in uh, saying that he's successful against the elder's advice, who wants to like make sure that the whole ship is secured first and operational before they report success. But he is eager to uh, report an immediate success of the successful capture. To uh, sort of disinterested Vorta, who uh, picks yeah. up the phone while uh, or the Zoom call while while looking away yes. at first, only at the end he actually looks at the screen, specifically to look at the elder. And this Vorta is really interesting because he's poking at this animosity right, between yes. them. Do I detect a note of jealousy in your voice? I'm sure it must be difficult for you to watch a new race of Jem'Hadar beginning to supplant you and the other members of the old guard. He's almost trying to inject it, which is, I hadn't really noticed at that point. Like, the the elder was less junior in his job. I guess that's the Vorta's role, right? They're intelligence gatherers, they're diplomats, Mm. manipulators, and they're always, like, poking for little weaknesses, which must be how they run their own ships as well. Yeah. Because controlling a a large group of Jem'Hadar is tricky, as we've seen before. But yes, uh, the first is very insecure about his position. He's, like, he's very... Controlling and dominant over it. I read that as insecurity. Insecure is in, yes, 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 because he's so overconfident. Yeah. And you never see it break, which is, you know, sometimes how insecurity is presented on right. screen. But yeah. a lot of the time, insecure people are really skilled at hiding it all the time. And then eventually that becomes pretty toxic. Yeah. Which is something that kind of happens here. I mean, there's some infighting. You know, there's like malicious compliance here and there later on yeah. from the second. So, yes, there's definitely... I'm trying to look at this from the firsts now, right? He's yeah. the alpha. Like, I'm, I'm kind of on his side now, just to give that, that counter perspective, because the, the second, who is a gamma, is also just like objecting to everything almost out of habit. Like, 
he rejects everything. And yeah. it becomes a little bit paradoxical because uh, uh, the first orders bring Captain Sisko up to the bridge and the second cautions him, oh, his execution should wait until the repairs are underway. Right. And then five minutes later, the second has to decide, oh, no, wait, hold on, you should execute him now. Yeah. So it's almost a bit knee-jerk from the second. Okay, yeah, I hadn't considered that. I was thinking, like, yeah, he was... Uh the more experienced do, officer. Doing, yes, who's yeah, like, well, I, I got more of a, well, that's not how we do this vibe. Yeah. That's, not, that, that's more like a, that's not how we have always done this vibe from him. Oh, which I was I, thinking, do you ever see the, the, the submarine movie U-571? Maybe. Or, actually, no, Cobalt's last gleaming in the second season of okay, uh, yeah. uh, Battlestar Galactica. Let's go yeah. with something you know, where a group has crash-landed, including a very, very experienced engineering officer who is only a, a petty officer, he's an yeah. NCO and therefore not in command, and a very, very green uh, lieutenant who oh, hands yes. out orders. Yeah. And the deck chief goes, that's, that's kind of not how we do, do it. it. Yeah. It's, you know, he's being awfully literal well, that's it. Yes, he 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 literally goes to a command procedure that they told him in officer school, and he's like, you oh, know, it's not how to do. It. But then again, that's not how you do it. Like as a, I mean, okay, I don't know this from military. I don't have any military training or experience, but in uh, Starship Troopers, Heinlein describes it very well. Ooh, um, we're going we're going the, deep into the sci-fi <laughs> lore here. Yeah, I'm yeah. yeah the, third, the then third lieutenant Rico gets basically told off by his commanding officer. He goes like, yeah, you're making a mess of things because you are walking around among your squad and you are getting on their nerves. What you do is you tell your sergeant how you want it and then you let the sergeant deal with it. Yeah. That's how it works. The sergeant is the man who harasses the troops. You're the one who commands them. And that's what, right. and that's what happens in that episode of Cobalt's Last Gleaming. The lieutenant tries to work the men directly. And no, he should tell the sergeant, this is what I want. This is what we're going to do, and then he should let the sergeant work it out, because that's the sergeant's job. Does he even have a sergeant, though? Oh, well, that's... I think that was... Oh, I'm not sure if that was the petty... Yeah, it was... Uh, no, he it was, was the, the, it was the, the deck chief. chief. Yeah, it was the deck chief who was running the thing. It was not Welcome a sergeant. Welcome to, yeah. to uh, <laughs> anyway. Battle, battle <laughs> Flan Galactica. Do you have a Battlestar Galactica uh, podcast? Hey, if we were going to start a Battlestar Galactica podcast oh my God. right now, what would we call it? Oh, Go. Um, First thought, oh, best thought. Jesus. Oh, that's like... Uh, um, Cattle Star Galactica, and it'll no. all be cows. Oh wow! Um, and battle... we'd have we'd, we'd have Moo, no, Mer instead of Boomer, oh, no. Gosh, no. Um, uh. It's tricky, isn't it? The only XO right now I want is Rem is Hennessy. <laughs> <laughs> If you're going to do that podcast, Cocky, you're on your own. I don't know shit about Battlestar Galactica, so I can't be your chief engineer when I don't know anything about it. Back to the show. Yes. Okay. Conveniently, for casting reasons, the majority of the crew have been put in in uh, a storage room. Oh, yeah, we, that's right. We never see any we of the crew. We never see them. In fact, at the end, Cisco gasses them along with the Jem Hadar. I mean, why not? Only the... <laughs> hey, it's a nice day off. It's anesthetic gas anyway. This is perfectly safe. Yes, because randomly dosed anesthetics yeah. are perfectly safe for, for everyone. All, all species. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yes. Back and the, to the interesting thing. people who are paid a lot of money to be sexy on screen are the all stuck crew. in the mess. Yeah. Namely, Worf, Cisco, Nog, Nog, and Kira. Yes. Who are have a quick little powwow about like what they should do now that they are in this situation. Just, Worf is pacing back and forth yes. and he's blaming himself and he's Nog look, goes... He's looking for a way to break out and Nog is very quiet and like... He's oh, he's just nervous. blaming himself. Yeah. You know, yeah. I should have done this, should have done yeah. that. And, and Nog says, oh, well, you couldn't have... Uh, d- 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 and Kira just goes, hey, shut, shush, shush, shush. Yeah. <laughs> Cisco verbally bitch slaps Worf and like, shut it. Like, you've been, you did what you need to, like, n- no blame is to be had here. So here's a fun little bit of trivia. The husband and I have been rewatching DS9. Yeah. And just on Friday, before we recorded this, we caught up to this episode. So I've actually seen it twice in, in, in three days. Oh, okay. That's uh, um, convenient. Yeah, and I've seen a bit of the next one. And for some reason now, I've been really thinking about Worf, because my husband doesn't like Worf. Yeah. Okay. As, as, no. you know, he's a terrible father, and, uh, and and he gets all these issues. And then it occurred to me because what we know about Klingon psychology, how he describes it, other Klingons describe it, like they're more aggressive than humans are used to, and that's managed in Klingon ships through the usual two things: outlet and pushback. 
right? Yeah. Let the crew push back against each other, give them outlets for their aggression, and then you can like benefit from all of that. But he doesn't get any of that in, in Starfleet. No, I guess not, because that's not the Starfleet way of doing things. Yeah. And if you don't like Worf, then you just see these outbursts and these like cultural demands that he makes on this environment that he gets a lot of accommodation for. But what you don't notice is that any time that he's being professional and reasonable, he's controlling a lot of impulses. Yeah. You know, right now he wants to rip the entire ship apart. He wants to beat the wall, and he's not doing that. So I sort of got this imagination while I was watching him pace back and forth. Imagine if Tuvok was here and just gave him a quick, just a little quick sort of mind meld (laughs) and just felt the actual emotions that were bubbling through beneath the surface. He would at first go, everybody clear the room. There's a a volcano exploding. (laughs) And then realize, oh, he's not. This is you every day? Yeah. (laughs) And then drop to his knees and like call in all the other Vulcans. We have a we have a new philosopher master. Like teach us your ways. The <laughs> oh, wow. emotional control that Worf must be executing yeah. all the time. How do you do it? Yeah. Because yeah. if we could do what you well, do, that depends a lot on. Uh, we wouldn't yeah, have yeah. Ponfar. We just fuck right. every day. But that like also depends a lot on your viewpoints on the nature versus nurture thing. Mm. Like are Klingons like this because they are that by nature, or is it just like a, a product of Klingon culture? And that's something that has been explored in uh, Star Trek before. There's an episode where uh, he comes across a prison camp oh. where Romulan and Klingon oh, right. prisoners, yes, yes, I, remember, and I know the episode. Yeah, yeah, and they've trained their way out of it, and the kids are. Uh, but yeah, like the, the, I remember the Klingon kids want to go. They want to go fight with Worf. They want to be taught about their heritage. Well, he has uh, to wake that up in them. He, yeah. he's like, close your eyes, smell. No, really smell. And, like, there's a huge world out there. Yeah. And you want to go explore it. And you mm. want to go... Yes, and the elders are like, well, crikey, we've been trying Just to... Like, we've been trying to breed down. this out. Like, we've tried not, not to expose them to this. So that, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a Next Generation episode, if I'm not mistaken, where that happens. Oh, you know what? Forget about Chief. Battlestar Galactica. Let's, oh. do a, let's, do a, let's do a Star Trek podcast instead. We'll call it, okay. I don't know. Joy of Trek. That's a good name. Mm. I wanted to do a cattle one. Stay with that theme. Fine. Is it Joy of Cows? I don't know. We come to the interior of the... Uh, uh, wait, is the Rubicon? Yes, it's the Rubicon. Oh, Chief, we haven't needed you a lot. Hey, Chief, how, how are you doing? I just noticed, like... You, you just called for him, and then I sort of blasted over that, and then, and then he had an opportunity to talk. And, hey, Chief, how's, how's it going? How's your, how's your week been? Maybe there's been a communication problem because he's small and he is in the console, and, like, we can't, like, communicate on radio frequencies. <laughs> oh, what was in the script? Where is, he, where is he currently? And, oh, yeah, he's inside the circuitry compartment. Oh, Chief, well... I hope you have enough, like, air in there mm-hmm. and, yes. uh, like, a little mini Twinkie, little, little oh. uh, mini... Or maybe just a regular size one. And Oh, no. Oh, the wow. Mo- then the molecules are too big. Again, we get into that. Don't you worry about me, boys. I'm doing just fine in here. So that's like something that I would like to... I mean, I'm not going to... I will get to there. <laughs> 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 Do you want us? You, I say we eject the world. Oh, no, you can. No, you no, can. no, no, no. I, it, like it's it's just a technical thing. You know, like you know, we said that that doesn't count as a warp core bridge. So the shutters on the Rubicon open, yes. and they look at. Whoa! There's a big fuck off wall there. And it's in the middle of nowhere. And what's this? It looks like an O, and you can kind of see Bashir like kind of like turning around and like like twisting himself so he can look up through the window. Guys, you want to sign up to uh, our Patreon and get this sheaf if you don't already have it. It's great. And then you get this great shot which uh, starts with the Rubicon and then it pans out. It it zooms out. Yeah. And it's gorgeous shot and becomes tinier and tinier and then this massive macro shot of the nose of the defiant and as a photographer i got really excited like they've just done some really fantastic work here uh, and they realized like oh oops we're still small on the nx 74205 defiant chief you're not gonna like this there's a little bit of techno bubble about how this has happened we didn't leave the anomaly by the same path of which we entered it so the process failed to reverse itself the only way to reverse that is by going back in and then coming back out through the correct path. But they're going to need help from the uh, Defiant with to do that. Yes, with the tractor beam and probably also the telemetry yes. of the correct path. Um, but first they have to get the Defiant's attention yeah. because their comms are down. I'm going. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. I was going to say, like, okay, the one thing that jumped out for me at this point was, like, they never mentioned the Dominion ship. I mean, they haven't seen it. It's right there. Well, yeah, but... 
It might be on the other side of the giant fucking defiant that they just yes. can't see it, right? Okay, so that, yeah, I, I, originally I didn't realize uh, during the episode that they don't have comms with the uh, defiant. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, and they also don't they have mention. like external sensors because you know that was the the question that Zia had. Sensors or windows? Give me yeah. one of them first, which is a really good way to like you know they're both very important, but I want one of them before the other. Yeah. Meanwhile, Cisco gets dragged off to the bridge and he immediately starts his psychological nitpicking. Oh, sorry, uh, scap picking is the word I was looking for. Uh, by like <laughs> trying, trying to get his fingers behind the yeah. Jem'Hadar. Yeah. And he's had some experience. Like we recently yeah. watched Invasive Procedures where DS9 is taken over. And there he also just watches his captors and goes, oh, yeah, where's this conflict? And I can just wiggle my little fingernails under the yeah, uh, see, uh, see, wallpaper. See where it start to itch and see where I can get a little tug and there. He's a, he's a master of that. Like he does that with many men. Like on, Kirk only wishes he was that good at talking. Uh. Yeah, he'd have to make up something like Fizzbin to get this kind of reaction. And Cisco managed to keep us cool. Oh, Ronald D. Moore talked about there was an original bit in the script by David Weddle and Bradley Thompson where this was taking place in actually the cargo bay where the rest of the crew were being held. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Jem Hadar much more directly like grabbed one of the ensigns and like held the disruptor to his head. Right. And like, okay, you're going to help me now. And Cisco refused and told the ensign it's going to be all right. And then the first says, no, it isn't. And, and blows him. his head off. Yeah. Ooh. And they just loved like the audacity of that scene. Right but it didn't fit the comedic tone. It had to go right. because otherwise the episode wouldn't hold together. Yeah, okay. I mean, I could have seen that. That would have made the Jim Hadar a more credible threat, I'll say. Yeah. I mean, this concept has been like... René Echevarria, he wrote this shortly after he joined The Next Generation yeah. as, a, as a freelancer. He wrote a spec script yeah. and it got like... He pitched it to eventually like Jerry Taylor in on The Next Generation. She rejected it. Michael Piller, when he became the showrunner of DS9, he rejected it. And I was Stephen Bear then took over as showrunner and he rejected it. And eventually in season six, wow. like he finally, Got it, uh, finally punished. relented. Well, I, I, I mean, on, on one hand, I can see that it would have been treated by the viewing community as like, oh, just a red shirt getting killed in, in order to establish the fact that there's danger here. But I can see how it could have been made to work as well. So uh, I can go both ways on that one. Second immediately sees what Cisco is doing. Because, like, giving him access to the engine room will only give him an opportunity to retake the ship. In fact, he's working on a plan at this very moment. At yeah, very and moment. now he wants him dead immediately. And the, fir and the first is like, oh, come on. Like, what do you want? I was not aware that telepathy was a gamma characteristic. And I was like he's very, being very dismissive, and this is where I'm really starting to feel that like he's really insecure about his position. He's like very uh, eager to prove himself, and even more eager to do it without listening to what the second has to say. Yes, yes, it's a particular kind of personality trait that I've witnessed in others. He's predisposed to decisions where he's overruling others. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's a very good way to put it. Yeah. It's a flaw among quite a few leaders. It's a tough one to weed out. And basically, they said, like, okay, you're going to fix the warp core. And he, like, he throws them some bullshit about... Uh, if you want me to teach your men how to repair a warp drive, that's fine with me. We'll begin with primary command and control systems. That should take about six hours. Then we will move up to basic engineering theory for class seven warp drive. Then enough! And he goes like, oh, yeah, well, you can have your bridge crew because they're the, absolutely the most suitable for repairing the warp drive. The bridge crew. Is <laughs> Why the bridge crew? Yeah. Because they were there at the time of <laughs> photography, yeah. I'm aware. Then we get the people on the Rubicon starting to play a game of Descent. And if I hadn't dated myself <laughs> with the, any previous comments, like... <laughs> oh, that's a good pull. <laughs> Oh, now I'm also thinking, oh, wow, yes, Descent, a famous early 3D shooter that, that featured, like, real 3D up and down environments. Yeah, and basically, gravity basically and mine tunnels with little ships flying through them trying to kill each other. Incredible. <laughs> wow, it was a 3D Realms one, wasn't yeah, yeah. it? I think so, yes. I'm yeah. not sure about the producer, but it was definitely one of the first full 3D environment uh, God, uh, those were the days of, like, that, uh, came out. Yes. video game companies being, well, building excessive, lavish offices and not really producing. Yeah, no, it's a good game. 
Daikatana wasn't. Oh, sorry, what wasn't? Daikatana. It was a, it was a very mm, famous doesn't game. Ring a bell. Okay. okay. So we'll do another podcast. They're some basically other time. flying through the plasma vent. I'm just going to like skip this because there's a little bit back and forth what, uh, what's happening here. All right, I'll follow but you. They maybe. are flowing through the plasma vent, and of course, then the uh, impulse drives are being activated. The plasma vents are being pre charged, heated. Miles O'Brien says, like, oh, well, we have only have a few seconds to get out of here. Fortunately, he is very familiar with the layout of these things. So he's like, down this corridor, take yep. a left and an immediate right, and then... It's like rally driving. This conduit's filthy, Chief. Don't you ever clean up in here? Yes. You know? Very, oh, very, very Turn much Turn left, so, sharp yes. right. Okay, and Jatsia follows his instructions. 600-year-old pilot experience. You can see the plasma already rushing towards them when they the come to the superheated plasma. Hatch. Which is about like, okay, I'm going to describe this hatch as charitable as I can. No. It has all the protection potential of a, a VCR saloon flap. door that yeah. flaps both saloon ways. Saloon door is exactly <laughs> how he described it to Mojave. It's a little, and it's just like at ankle height. Yeah. It's the side of a VHS and, tape would fit through it. And they kind of like burst through it. And apparently that flappy door flaps shut again. And the, the supercharged plasma on the other side. Only a little bit vents into, into yeah, here. Yeah, nobody really notices that. <laughs> it's like, okay. Incredible. I'm not going to call it a warp core bridge, but this is one of the things that I have mentioned as like, a little bit of the technology which is like mm, okay okay i'm on your side because yes why do you have a system that there is a saloon door essentially between <laughs> yes. you and space and, and also plasma, and superheated plasma superheated plasma but plasma doesn't have to be very dense does it in fact no. it wants to be not dense at all oh, it wants to be not plasma well, I mean, once it's plasma, it just wants to expand and expand and expand, and then... Well. I don't know. I mean, like, that's the, the whole trick in uh, uh, tokamak reactors is to try to keep it as a plasma and to try to keep it from touching the walls. You know, so the generally magnetic containment is what's used for that kind Phases of Phases of matter, as I was taught. Yeah. Solid, most stable, yeah. crystalline, a liquid, which is usually and, optimal, mm, right? yeah. gaseous, least dense of those three yeah. and then plasma which requires a lot of heat which is where the actual components of the atoms let go of one another yeah, under basically immense heat basically and energy. free electrons basically the electrons, Protons, the electron neutrons. cloud kind of breaks down and it becomes a an amorphous i don't i'm pretty sure that the atomic core structure remains stable oh does it oh i cool. think so i'm not i don't know i don't know for sure i thought like <gasps> plasma was just greg yeah we've got a job <laughs> yeah. for the chief come on in <laughs> Okay, this is the kind of science that I'm not the best at, so I'm going to explain this as best as I was able to understand it. When it comes to plasma, yes, heat is usually required for plasma, like neon signs and lightning are examples of heated plasma. However, when you're talking about the phase transition from plasma to a gas, because that's the only direction which that can go, it, you can't do plasma directly to a liquid, there is a lot of disagreement there, and that's when it becomes a lot more about context, and scientists are not in good agreement on when something becomes a plasma or a gas specifically. That becomes a lot more fuzzy. So as far as an answer to that, your guess is as good as mine. It really just depends on what exactly the specific context is, is where we have, okay, this is our agreed upon definition for this case. In other cases, maybe not. Well, okay, that settles that. Thank I you. I think he explained that really well yes, and did. very thoroughly. I was really impressed, like, how he mimed a PowerPoint presentation. Yes. I mean, that seems to be the thing for this uh, particular episode, that, like, it's so, so bad that you can't see us what we're doing, because, like, all these gestures and, like hand motions are which are really essential to the things that we are explaining or just simply cannot be conveyed properly through audio <laughs> <laughs> um yes well i mean uh, uh, that is essentially not true i mean i'm i'm sitting here watching you and i'm fine <laughs> and, I've caught, and i've kept my arms crossed the entire time so not, I, was I wasn't like... going to call you out on that i mean <laughs> <laughs> we're pretty expressive, but like there is a reason why we're podcasters and we don't do YouTube or anything. It's just it's too much work, guys. Anyway, this brings the Rubicon out into main engineering, and this is followed by a whole series of shots where, for some reason, 
the Jem'Hadar don't see this little shuttle <laughs> flying around, flitting about. It all, but there's a few like almost getting grabbed uh, as they're reaching for a tool scenes. They're they're just like flying about, uh, hiding among the ductwork. Uh, this episode was nominated for, uh, <laughs> let me see, an Emmy Award for Outstanding Visual Effects in the Series, because, yeah, it was okay, a no, tour de force. Oh, I will give it that. Like, absolutely. It looked amazing. Never seen anything like it on Star Trek. It was like it was like the first time they see the trouble with Tribbles. They say, yeah. holy shit, Star Trek's capable of this? Yeah. Just on telly? Absolutely amazing. But yeah, there's a bit of a bit of panto, like, oh, oh, he's behind you. And the Gem Condor goes, what? What? Yeah. <laughs> a scene that we've missed, by the way, is after the commander reports that... We will have impulse power back online in 30 minutes, but it will take several hours to restore warp capability. Ah, uh, yes. Which, uh, the... Uh, what's, what's his name? Co- the, oh, we don't know the name of this particular... I mean, uh, he has a name. Chief, what's the name of this Vorta? That would be Gelnon, who appeared in both this episode as well as the following episode, Honor Among Thieves, and he is played by Leland Crook. Anyway, right. we can oh. call him the Vorta because Sorry. per ship there is one Vorta. Right. Oh, I, saw, I thought Vorta was just like their name. They're like the boss is always Vorta. Was what I th- kind of thought that it was. I didn't know they had individual names. They do. Um, okay. Most famous being Weyoun, played oh, by Jeffrey yes. Coombs. Yes, I thought they were all played by Jeffrey Coombs. Uh, this one isn't. Oh, and there's yeah. a female one. And oh, there's, okay. a, there's a few Sorry. others yeah. we see, but they keep getting cloned. So oh, that must be it. You can kill um, him and bring the actor. And back. there's this gorgeous shot of the Dominion ship flying off and it kind of looks like uh what's it called a shield crab or a trilobite like you know with the oh, uh, a horseshoe crab horseshoe crab that's the one right from the underside yeah yeah, got, yeah that's the one that kind of looks imagine like, like a synth wave horseshoe with crab. the glowing yeah the glowing purple abdomen which are covered by the shell of its upper shield starship sh- troopers it's, yeah it's like amazing, uh, 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 scarab yes it's an amazing shot love that visual yeah Hey, check out the Patreon. I think I oh, think we're yeah. talking ourselves into putting these sheeps up on the on <laughs> okay. the on the Patreon. So that'll be a reason. Five dollars a month would really really help us out. Our, our hardworking chief We've got to keep him supplied with synth hall and uh, <laughs> pump his his little circuitry compartment full of worker hall to keep him interested. Yeah. There's a weird insinuation that I'm being like drugged here or being put against my will to doing this. If you're just pumping worker hall into my circuit. I, am, Am I being kidnapped? Is that what's happening here? Is is the is the worker on my catch cell white and you're just help send help? Um, the it, worker hall. I love that. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, it's twenty percent of the atmosphere on Voyager. It's the only explanation. <laughs> I mean. By my theory of uh, Starfleet being filled with overachievers, I th- believe that uh, that's just standard in any atmosphere ship. Aha. Uh-huh. Although some people apparently have a uh, antidote against it, like uh, what's her name Don't. F- from uh, Lower Decks? Oh, Mariner yeah. Beckett Mariner. Yes. Yeah, she has an odd relationship. I mean, yeah. we find out stuff about her. Like it's it's she's, she's not just an interesting archetype. Mm. Behind, besides, the whole series about is the other guys. Like yeah, you've got yeah. the super performers. In, actually, in a way, Jake Sisko was designed to fill that sort of role on Deep Space Nine. because Right, on, but he's not part of Starfleet. No, exactly. But on The Next Generation, like you had Wesley Crusher, who wanted to be in Starfleet. And yeah. He was brilliant. He was like the next generation of the next generation. That's kind of like what Nog does here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And here, like Jake is just a regular guy. Yeah, he wants to be a writer. Yeah, good at other things. Yeah. It's not interested in, and uh, in a, this. And uh, a domjot hustler. <laughs> Got to get that table rejotted. Yeah. Okay, so the Rubicon has now seen the Gem Hadar, and they quickly f- sort of fly up some pipes and hide behind some, uh, so they've got yes. a little bit of oversight. And the chief engineer, a hey, Brian O, is as good as our chief engineer. Oh. Manages to get some visuals, and they quickly suss out what's happening. Yes, because they can actually see what the crew is doing. The capsule's trying to take control of the ship from engineering. Kira is the only one actually working on the warp drive. It doesn't look like she's in any hurry to get it done. I think Worf's trying to cover their tracks. It looks like he's sending false signals to the computer system. Because uh, that's what number two is pushing for. It's like, yeah, you, you teach him how to do this job, yes. and then he'll do it rather than you do it. And she's like, well, it would be faster if I do it myself. But no, no, he doesn't fall for that one. Yeah, the like, second is yeah. trying to prevent, like, mutiny or... Or, oh, well, or sorry, sabotage. Sabotage, yeah, yeah. Which is actually what Cisco tells Worf to do. Plant a computer virus in the warp plasma subprocessor. 
Decided to cause a core breach once the ship reaches warp one. Basically, the plot of Speed with Keanu Reeves. You know, no, it's the other one. It's like if, if you go if, over, if they drop below, if, it would have been if they once they go over warp one and they drop below it, then they explode. Which would have been a better plan, to be honest. Because odds are that when they drop out of warp, it'll be next to a, a Dominion ship, and oh. they'll and do stand a chance of doing some damage to that. So that would have actually been a better plan, I think. Let's look at this division of labor because yeah. I think this is a this is a really interesting one. Nog has been tasked with decryption. Yes, he's uh, trying to get the command codes transferred from the bridge to engineering. And Nog's a clever kid, but that's going to take him weeks. Yes. It's not going to work. He's tried multiple algorithms and encryption codes, and it's not working because the, the secondary system is always kicking him back after he breaks the primary. Yeah, he even confides in, in Cisco when they have a moment to talk, like, this isn't going to work. I hope you have a backup plan. Yeah. And he said, yes, I'll destroy the ship. There are still a few algorithms I haven't tried yet. So he's been said to that. Worf is running interference. Yes, and Kira is the one who's actually working and slowing things down. And I think this is really brilliant because Kira, like she's been in La Résistance before, mm-hmm. she's the best liar. Yeah. She's a better liar than Worf is. Yeah. Right? Because she's done it for, for survival. Yeah. She's, she's done infiltration missions. She can do this much better. And, 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 and so when she says at some point, hey, I can't fool this guy for much longer, you don't argue. No, you know, that's true. Yes. Yeah. You don't... You don't lean on her and say that she has to try a little bit harder. Like, Cisco leans on Nog, you know, as the green ensign. Yeah. I do need you to try a little harder. Okay. At the same time, first comes in and, like, complaining about why the warp drive isn't ready yet. Second immediately blames it on Cisco, who does a brilliant fake outrage. Stalling! Your second is the one who's slowing down the work. He countermands my orders, arbitrarily reassigns my crew. I can't get any work done in here. First falls for it, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. But he does the classic, like, you have 30 minutes to uh, restore power, and then I start killing people. Because that's really going to make it go faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. But he also tells Second, get off their case. Yes. Get out of their way. You're also being held responsible. Yeah. Now, we have skipped over a really interesting scene, uh-huh. which is when Cisco was being brought down to engineering. He was alone in the elevator, the strangely bright and stroboscopic elevator, uh, a yeah. turbo lift, yeah. where he asked the Second about this situation, who was remarkably open. Yeah. Where he mentioned, you know, I used to be, I used to be first, and let me tell you, if I was still first when we captured you dead, yeah. Which he actually goes, throws back to him later. Like, you should have gone with your instincts. It's like, <laughs> yeah. But it's a cool bit of respect between two experienced leaders. Oh, yeah. Right? Both of whom who've, who've experienced situations where they're having to take commands from less excellent leaders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they can sort of relate to that. But it doesn't stop Cisco from throwing the second under the bus. Of course not. I mean, that's his job at this point. So I've got a question. How is the Rubicon maneuvering? What is it using? Judge is maneuvering the Rubicon. I'm not, I'm not asking who's piloting it. Like, oh, okay. What, what kind of propulsions? Are they using thrusters? We, we know that like uh, Star Trek ships have thrusters, uh-huh. impulse, and warp drive. Mm-hmm. Right? So which one are they using to maneuver around when they're flying? I know. I know. <laughs> and like, do they have intake vents? Right? Do you want to push the button for the warp core? I mean, okay, you, I, I will I push will, the button. Yeah, the okay. There we go. Oh, that's the wrong one again. Nope. Damn it. Sorry, oh, you, sorry, uh, no, you just port. negated it. You've got <laughs> negative one warp drive, and now we've actually spoken over shacks. That's how bad it is. No, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the judges now. They're shaking their heads. I'm sorry, Kay. You missed this opportunity. Okay. I've got, oh, well. Mm. <laughs> but actually, yeah. I, actually, allow me to say this myself, because I, I know what they're doing. They're maneuvering on their anti-grav system because we've seen this before like whenever a, whenever yeah. a ship uh, moves out of the hangar deck it kind of like floats up and then it zooms out of course that only works in a gravity field so it yeah. only works for a shuttle when it's inside a ship once they're outside the ship they have to go to thrusters and later on to impulse and warp they now have the gravity nets of the uh, yeah. uh defiant they can just use their own anti-gravity drive to uh hey they're using whatever propulsion they usually use when they land on a planet and don't want to incinerate the right. atmosphere yes Right? Mm, yes, I suppose, yeah. yeah Except so, on a much smaller scale, so, so it's the, even so safer the anti- to be The anti graph system, let's well, call it I don't that. Know, maybe, you know, maybe even the impulse, hey, who knows how any yeah. of this works? But it's expertly piloted. Now their big challenge is okay. Nog's a smart kid, but it's going to take him weeks to release the codes from here. Can we do anything to help him? Not from engineering. If we could get to the bridge, we could release the codes from there. 
Jadzia hangs out near like a toolbox yep. where she's got line of sight with the door, just waiting for somebody to, more to very, walk through. More very inobservant Jemadar. Dun, 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 dun. But they managed Land to of slip the into the elevator, right over to the bridge, where they miss their opportunity to slip out and they have to do the most adorable little nose boop of the uh, Rubicon against oh, the Oh, that's when they panel. have to leave again. Yeah, it's yeah. really, really cute. Oh, let's definitely take the time to sort of explore it. Oh, I hope that Jeef worked. Like, well, I wrote a script to take Jeefs of every moment in the episode where a subtitle is in view yeah. and some moments in between. And then some of them didn't work, like 0.2% just got yeah. borked and just and just didn't yeah, work. Yeah, so we get a shot of every every subtitle and then every few seconds if there isn't any subtitles on ships. So yeah. Well, the, if that's what it, what it amounts to. Uh-huh. Uh, so we've got about a thousand Jeeves here. So they decide that we are, they're going to help them out by rerouting the security system at the command council technobabble thing. Uh, yeah, it's basically which, to help not yes. achieve his goal. Which requires them to beam into the security console and do some manual readjustment. Yep. Because the Rubicon's hiding underneath a console, and... Okay, how are we going to do that? Well... You wouldn't be able to go out there even if you wanted to. You wouldn't be able to breathe. The oxygen molecules outside are almost 2,000 times larger than anything your hemoglobin could assimilate. You'd suffocate. Well, we'll just, like, beam some oxygen in there, and it'll... You've got, like, some time to breathe. It's got about 20 minutes. And I'm just like, again, like... They why don't, don't do have, it twice? Why, yeah, that, that's the other one. Like, yeah, yeah because I have that start. written down in my, in my and notes. And also, like, don't they have breathing apparatus? They, they must have, like, a smoke I thing. I know. Like, don't they have, like, all you need is just, like, a little oxygen generator. Exactly. Which you can just put over your face and it generates chemical. Just a little bottle. Chem- yeah. It's, you can just bring a little, a little scuba. No little, problem. Yeah. Just like one of, those, sc- one of those things that fall out of the ceilings in planes, you know? A little scubet yeah. is all you need. <laughs> All right. If we beamed into the primary safeties junction, we should see a cluster of heuristic subprocessors next to a rectilinear expansion module. So we get a lovely scene of <laughs> Brian O and uh, what's his name? Bashir. Bashir. Walking through these isolinear chips, which are plugged in. It's hilarious. They've got like these big cables, which look like they're. Uh, they're yeah, enormous. Ch- yeah, uh, they do remind me of those like tubes that you occasionally see hooked up to planes when they're still standing on the apron for uh, providing extra ventilation to the engines or cooling powder. Or, oh, or right. That's what. Uh, except those are yellow usually because they have to stand out on the apron. These are all white and they kind of look like huge tubes. Like the, look, the, it looks like a kids' game show. Yes, very, no, very, like very the, good. The, yes. the set of a Nickelodeon like game show, and you've got to clamber <laughs> over them. American Gladiator. American you know, that, Gladiator, <laughs> Japanese uh, spectacular game show, all these glowing things were even even reminded me of like how the interior of a computer was represented in the 1990s film Hackers oh, yeah. with Johnny Lee Miller and Angelina Jolie, and both of them wear a hot red Lycra dress. Definitely go watch that movie. <laughs> Woke a lot of things up for a lot of people in the 90s. Yes. So O'Brien tells... Oh, we tells did miss the booping thing. You're completely right. That's how they opened the, uh, yeah, the yeah, turbo the lift. To, to get back onto, onto the ship. So Bashir and O'Brien are walking around, and it's basically Bashir is just there for moral support. That ship behind you is carrying 20 microamps of electric current. Now, it's not very much, but it's enough to fry every synapse in my tiny body. Thanks for the tip. 20 microamps, which could fire every synapse in, in my body. body. Yes. Oh, hmm. And you passed medical school, did you? <laughs> you only, you only <laughs> mistook well, a pre-ganglionic <laughs> fiber for a post-ganglionic <laughs> nerve. nerve. Yes. And nobody bothered to correct you on the word synapse. Hmm. Uh, so there's like a bit, a bit of fussing around. Like O'Brien has to be helped by Bashir to remember where he is and where he at. It's like he's start, he starting to... really well. Yes, he does that very good. Yes, he talks him through. He's like, okay, so we have this chip. Oh, there's at least two dozen of those things in here. Okay, and but, what's this one over yeah. here? No, still nothing? So okay. any, anywhere those two come together, and that's when he goes like, oh, yeah, there's only one place where there's one of those at the base of one of the other ones, and that's like over and there. He specifically does it. Yeah. Like, like, they all look the same. Yeah, don't, don't look. Yeah. Close your eyes, picture it. Because he literally says, I can draw this thing from memory. And it's like, yeah, so like use that then. Yeah. Which leads to a scene where they are like juggling these big pipes. With a great effort, Bashir finally plugs it into the right port, only oh no, for it to it immediately falls fall out. So we've got again. to try again. And then and we go to bloody bayonet closing on that. Just gave a twisted a quarter turn and it should stick in there. Time for round three of Takeshi's Castle or whatever <laughs> we're doing. Yes. How much fun must it have been to build this set? <laughs> yes. Right, and to play around in it. 
O'Brien does a bit of spot welding with his phaser by like getting Julian to like plug the thing back in. Like now, turn your head away. Yeah, don't look at this. And he just like just lean back a bit, phasers. and then from the hip, <laughs> phasers it. Yes, unbelievable, dude. <laughs> and they're both like no, high on anoxia. Okay, okay, so it's not on. No, it's not funny. You can see him with his stretch, his arms. Uh, or actually, yeah, that's good form. Unsupported, just loosely sort of point and click. Yes, and and both of them are like soups woozy because uh, yes, Jatia just refuses to beam any more air in. Oxygen, oxygen. No, yeah. <laughs> and I don't have their little scubette that they ought to have. Captain, I did it. I don't know how, but I released the command codes. Well done. Doesn't realize he was helped, doesn't, but it suddenly hey, it worked. Hey, take yeah. credits. Oh, you, no, absolutely. You succeeded. Because this is how people in Starfleet succeed. You've got friends, yep. got people on your crew, and you work together even if you don't know it. Ooh, but just a success is within their reach. Suddenly they're all uh, summoned to stand on one side again. How long has the warp drive been prepared? At least one hour. Maybe longer. And they managed to conceal it from you? Uh, number two is definitely losing some credits here. Yeah, there's blame going back and forth. Hey, if you, you, you told me not to interfere. Yeah, I did tell you to watch them. Yeah. I'm actually on the side of the first here a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I know he's made it difficult for the second, and they're just different command styles. I don't think he was necessarily wrong. Well, they have a little argument about which is true. Two says, like, we need to check everything for sabotage, which he is absolutely correct in. Yes. And again, one goes like, well, no, spending time, more time in Federation space exposes us to detection, and we, you wouldn't want your last mission to end in failure now, would you? Hey, but that's, I think that's a valid command decision as well. Like, yes, yeah. there's a risk of sabotage, but there's also a risk of discovery and destruction. Like, yep. which problem do you want to have? Oh, true. Right? And and that's something that a leader has to do, and very quickly. Number one orders us to bring us to warp four, and... At least we're going to take them with us. <laughs> I and love her attitude. Everybody is very calm, especially Nog is very calm among that. Like, you know, from the others I kind of expected, but Nog is very, like... You can see him looking a little bit apprehensive, but he doesn't... I bet Worf is just rock hard, oh, like I... double boners, <laughs> like, yeah, today is a good day to die, <laughs> finally! <laughs> Dear diary, <laughs> it finally happened. Today was a good day to die, yes. <laughs> but fortunately, the uh, Rubicon goes on a little killing spree with its phasers and its photon torpedoes. Yeah, the Jem'Hadar tried to shoot it. Terrible. Firing like, really close to the warp drive. Yeah, I noticed that, yes. <laughs> like, like that's okay. Any one of those stray shots would have done it. Yeah. We've all seen First Contact. We know how fragile that system is. But yeah, Jadzia gets some uh, straight to the heart. Torpedo and you're lock. now dead. Yes, we're too close for missiles. Go to phasers. <laughs> <laughs> Nock gets knocked about a bit. Jadzia. Everybody gets in on the action. No, like, warp does a little classic neck snap. <laughs> Ugh, yeah. Such a gruesome move. Also, very impressive because Jem Hadar are famously hardy. Yes. But he's had some one on one combat training, so he's probably snapped a few Jem Hadar yeah, I mean, necks before. He probably has a, a, a specific hollow deck program for Jem Hadar. For neck snapping? Yeah. Ooh. I mean, we've seen his calisthenics program, so. They are very colorful. <laughs> Kira grabs a weapon. Cool move that she does. She mm. does a little somersault over a, a spare dead Jem Hadar's weapon and, and takes cover and blam, blam, blam. Everybody's. Oh, the whole crew's working together. I'm flooding all the compartments except the engine room with anesthesine gas. Major, get that virus out of the computer before someone on the bridge engages the warp drive. Aye, sir. The day is saved, and Cisco. I mean, it's a bit gloaty, him standing over the dying second. Oh, yes. He should have listened to you and killed me when he had the chance. It's also a bit of, like, respect and acknowledgement. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah. I, because I, that's how I, the I, second I that, responds. Yeah. He was a first. They don't need him. Listen. As he says, obedience brings victory. Yes. And victory brings... <laughs> I'm reminded of an episode of Babylon 5. Yeah. Where the uh, alien Centauri character, uh, Londo Malari, tells the story of, do you know, on my planet, there used to be uh, a second sentient species called the Zahn, and we fought many terrible wars together, which led to all of these traditions. And do you know what it was that the last Zahn said at the moment of his death? Do you know the words that he said? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> a very popular and pretty dark Centauri joke. Yes. <laughs> After the commercial break, everything has been restored as it should be. <laughs> yeah, because 
<laughs> Cisco goes to, to, to Worf, hey, your wife's here. Yeah. And she flies the Rubicon up to his nose. And, and she's sort of him through, through the window, yes. <laughs> and you've got this huge close-up on his double nostril face. Ooh, ooh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and yes, we were in Worf's bar. Uh, we were in Quark's bar. Wow, Worf's bar would have been a different thing. Yeah. Where Odo comes in. Oh, yeah. No, first there's the poem. Ah, uh, yes. yes. Blood wine. And yes, can I finish here the poem? And Jadzia yes. really wants it. And she's, he says, it's not finished. Yes. Well, can I have the first line? <laughs> well, all, all right, then. But it is my first poem. Yes. And I've worked long and hard on it. <laughs> and I do not wish to be ridiculed. <laughs> yes. And then he's like, <laughs> this is the story of a little ship that took a little trip. What do you think? And like she cottons on very quickly. Oh, it takes her it, so long. Well, like rhymes. first she goes, yeah. well, it definitely does rhyme. Yes. And he's got this poker face. Yeah. And it's his, it's, I think this is canonically his first real joke. Okay. Because I think he spent all this time working on this joke. Ah, very right, good. more yes. so than the poem. Oh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a joke, and he, and it's such a good one. He's so proud of himself. <laughs> but no, there's nothing on the pad, and uh... and they're so fun together. They are. They are a lovely couple. And Odo, who has not had much to do, sort of walks in past where... It's the uh, first time we see him this episode, yeah. Bashir and O'Brien are telling tall tales to mourn how, and how uh, they were, a young yeah, woman. How, how they did this amazing uh, deed and they were flying around and they were shooting things and they rescued this day. And So close to the Jem Hadar, we can see the veins in his eyes. Like, they're, they're doing a really good job telling this story. And Odo is just goes like... Are you sure you've returned to your normal size? Of course. Why? Well, you both appear to be a couple of centimeters shorter than you were the last time I saw you. A changeling notices that sort of thing. And they both sort of blanch, especially when Quark comes up. I didn't want to say anything, but you do look a little on the petite side. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sure it's like, quick, to sick bay. <laughs> <laughs> and we have this lovely moment between Quark and uh, Odo. <laughs> Where they essentially high-five each other. Yes. This was just a casual, like, oh. Uh, they they yeah, raise eyebrows at each other, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they say you don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> Such a good episode! Yes. yes. I was looking at my little soundboard so I think we need. Well. Oh, no, that's the, the last one is the exit thing. So, okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I've got one for this. All right. Here, look. Sound can't be played, file not found. Oh, f what happened to my soundboard? Okay, well, we'll f I'll, I'll figure this out. It was going to be a little flourish of the music. Okay. But we'll so, let's see. Uh, I, I Next think, time. Okay, Boo. not a, okay, not a uh, warp core breach, but at one point, one of the Jem Hadar accuses Cisco of treachery. Stop when he's picking not your nits, you'll go blind. When he's not complying, and it's like, it's not treachery. <laughs> it's like, he didn't, he didn't promise nothing. He's like, he's not, <laughs> like, he's a prisoner. He's like being put to work. It's like, he cannot commit treachery. It's like, you can't. Yes, it's in fact, well, at least on, on Earth, we have codes of war, which includes like, yeah. it, it's a prisoner's duty to survive, evade, resist, and escape. I yeah. think that's the doctrine in the, Something in, like in that, the yeah. States. Ah, oh, but there's also like all sorts of things where, if you do, actually, no, this is valid. You give up your prisoner status, and then your life no longer has to be protected. Right. Okay, so, um, deleted scenes. You said you had a good one? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this is a little bit grim. After okay. I, after I can, uh, the cargo bay. Yeah. Right, where all the rest of the crew <laughs> yes. have not been involved in any of this. So they've suddenly get the, the gas. Suddenly getting gassed. Yeah. And they're all huddling together. And like, what are they doing? And then, like, there's one particular, like, a display console where they can see that it's Cisco's command codes. <laughs> and they're all just, the captain is gassing us. Yes. What did we do, Daddy? No! Okay, yes, <laughs> that's a good one. Too dark? <laughs> no, no, I can get there. I can okay. get in with that, yes. At, at first I thought I wanted to see a scene where Bashir is doing a guided meditation of O'Brien to get him to remember how to get to the oh, right place I in like the isolinear that. chips. But the second one is, no, what I really wanted is Galaxy Quest-esque scenes where they have like a chomper scene when they're jumping through <laughs> the isolinear <laughs> chips which are moving around, which they need in order to get to the uh, correct place to... Uh, <laughs> Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> Rather than them tugging hoses around, I wanted to see something where they had to like move their way around the console and yes. jump the big gap over the electron flow or something like that. Yeah, and then just go through the chompers and yeah. then you have <laughs> Sigourney Weaver yeah. very clearly mouthing, What the f*** is this? 
Yeah. <laughs> Why is it here? It makes no logical sense. <laughs> it's here because it was in the show. <laughs> So, what do we have for next week? Let's find out, because we've sort of settled into this pattern that our chief engineer, Greg, picks out the next episode for us, looking at all the recommendations we've been given and also trying to give us a, a nice little, like, blend of all the various Star Treks that there are. And so he's recorded a few lines so that we can try and guess what it's going to be. Bring it on. Okay, here comes number one. Mr. Chekhov, the floor is no place for an officer. Okay. So, so original series? Or one of, of the movies? Gotta be, right? Well, Mr. Chekhov, oh. the floor is no place for an officer. Ooh. He's not going to make us do a movie. I mean, I love the movies and everything, but it's oh. an awful long, it'd be oh, awful yes. long recording. Let's so, say that let, for a special so occasion. So let's say, yeah, probably original series, which makes the odds of us guessing which episode it is very small. Yes, because neither <laughs> of us are very familiar. Oh, it could be, uh, oh, I was going to say, it could be animated series, but it couldn't because Walter Koenig wasn't invited back. No. Okay, number two. He's probably terrified of your beads and rattles. Ooh. Probably can... terrified of beads and rattles. I wonder if it's the one with the hippies. Oh, again, you're, you're, oh, I'm already out of my depth here. All right, next Herbert, one. you are Herbert. Anyway. We reach. We re Someday I'll show it to you. I okay. haven't even seen it myself, yeah. but there's a there's one about space hippies and like they're they're like because we reach. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you're and okay. if you're not cool, then you're Herbert. That's all oh, I know. Oh, right. That sounds vaguely familiar, but yeah. Strange how it seeps into <laughs> culture, isn't yes. it? Okay, number three. Yes, of course. That is exactly why I hate you, because you are identical. Oh. Okay. Because you're identical. So it's maybe a clone episode? Clones? Spock, Spock getting cloned again. How many times did Spock get cloned in the original series? Oh. Or in total? I kind of want to ask Chief, but I'm worried that we maybe get a, a spoiler, spoiler. For, yes. for next time. So okay. let's not worry about that one. Okay, number four. Our last one, I think. Yeah? I'm not programmed to respond in that area. Oh, that sounds like a data thing. Yeah, but it's, it's the original series. Yeah. They didn't have, like... Um, they weren't um, to the computer then, were they? No, they weren't. Noonien Sung in the... Let's hear Ooh. it again. I'm not programmed to respond in that area. Ooh. Maybe it is the computer. Maybe it's Major Barrett's. Yeah. So something about beads, Chekhov's on the floor, they're all identical, and we have really not seen much of no, the original series. I'm afraid so. that I am out of my depth here. So, so unfortunately, <laughs> our guess is random, right? Chief, let's hear it. What is it going to be? The original series, season two, episode 12, I... Mud. Ooh, oh, it's mud. Yeah, he's ah. back again. Or, you know, this is the, the original yeah, encounter yeah. with mud, probably. I was literally just list today listening to our episode uh, from uh, Discovery where the, uh, the time... Magic the time to make the sanest yes, man go the mad <laughs> featuring... Yes. Oh, this is going to be so exciting. What an amazing recommendation. Okay, okay. Fantastic. Really, really excited about that. Okay, so I want to have a little commemorative poem of my own. It's not, entirely, it's not entirely appropriate, but it was what sprung to my mind at the end of the episode. There once was a Klingon on Bajor, whose skills with the Batleth were major. He started to fight with all of his might and did his commander a favor. Whoa! <laughs> with that, what the hell was that? It I was a fantastic start. fucking poem, and we're leaving Starfleet. Oh, Energize! <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode with your friends Kay and Kaki. Production and editing by your chief engineer Greg and music by Fox Amore. Join us next time for I Mud, the original series, season two, episode 12. Visit joyoftrek.com slash links to send us your recommendations, support us on Patreon, or to find us on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening to The Joy of Trek, and we'll see you out there. Thank you.